Um, um, my name is Zeng Wan. I'm a, one of the neuromuscular neurologists here. Um, today's topic is about uh, uh, acute neuromuscular disease in the ICU. As we know, the most neuromuscular diseases are chronic. Uh, we see patients uh, in the clinic, uh, but uh, occasional uh, uh, when we are on call, we get to see the patient in the ICU. Um, so the patient in the ICU, they say the patient's not moving, patient has uh, respiratory failure, you're intubated, and for several days now, patient's still not moving, they're asking neurology to see, to see any other neurological conditions, um, especially so relatively young patient without other significant past uh, medical history. So today's the objective is uh, a threat, uh, you recognize the acute neuromuscular disease in the ICO. Hopefully after today's talk, uh, so we will know how to diagnose and treat uh, the neuromuscular diseases in the ICO. Uh, I have no disclosure uh, for this talk. Um, you talk about the acute neuromuscular disease in the ICU. Basically, there's two categories. The first one is the diseases uh, leading to ICU admission. And the second one is uh, the disease happened in the ICU after ICU admission. So the disease leading to ICU admission, including the Guillain-Barré syndrome and the Martinia gravis. That's the most two common ones. And others like inflammatory myopathy or like a polymyositis or some botulism are extremely rare. Uh, personally, I have now seen such cases, um, uh, you know, the, I mean, the, in the ICU. Uh, the diseases happen after any, uh, ICU admission, and including the uh, critical illness polyneuropathy and a critical illness myopathy. Um, last week, our pediatric neuromuscular specialist, Dr. Amanda Raju, Rogers, gave a, a detailed, a very good presentation and a detailed discussion about the Guillain-Barre syndrome and the Martinia gravis. Uh, today, I will focus on the second group, as a critical illness polyneuropathy and a critical illness myopathy. Let's talk about the case first. Uh, when, when I was on call in September, uh, the local ER called one to transfer a patient, uh, 56 years old, with uh, progressive muscle weakness. Um, about 10 days ago, patient had a low fever and the diarrhea and the fatigue. So they think possible the COVID, patient probably get a COVID, but the COVID test was negative. About five days ago, patient started to have a numbness tingling in his fingers and the toes. And two days ago, patient that's a numbness tingling is getting worse, also started to have weakness in his arms and the legs. Um, a day ago, patient's weakness getting much worse and then unable to walk. In the meantime, patient developed urinary retention. Uh, otherwise, patient uh, has no trouble talking, chewing, swallows fine, there's no breathing issues. Um, so the possible medical history was, possible medical history was, on, you know, just regular things like high blood pressure, hyperlipidemia, uh, giving patients, uh, you know, progressive weakness or what call ascending weakness, and uh, we decided just, you know, admit the patient to ICU directly. When patient get to the ICU, uh, we examined the patient. Patient's cranial nerve was fine, and the muscle strength of three or five in the upper extremities, and a of two or five in the lower extremities. Uh, we could not get any reflexes. Uh, the patient's sensory action at that time was unremarkable. Even the patient has uh, a lot of uh, numbness tingling when you examine the patient, actually sensation was unremarkable. And the outer line, patient had uh, some, uh, you know, uh, 
other uh, workup, including um, a CT of the head was unremarkable. Patient had an MRI of the cervical and the thoracic spine. They say unremarkable. The patient you had a, a lumbar um, puncture, and the CSF study shows WBC three, RBC eighty nine, protein just borderline uh, forty three, glucose sixty. So basically, it's unremarkable except the borderline protein. So we decided to give patient treatment and uh, treat give patient IVIG for uh, you know uh, the, the working diagnosis of uh, GBS, the Guillain-Barré syndrome. So the patient still getting worse every day. I took care of the patient for three days uh, before I signed off. And the patient, uh, the, uh, on day three, the patient become a quadriplegic. Uh, they could not move arms or legs. And also patients started to have Borbar palsy uh, uh, syndrome. So patient uh, um, cannot talk very well and uh, trouble swallowing. And of course the patients, uh, the breathing become very labor. And then, the patient was intubated on day three. Um, so we got the neural connective study and the EMG uh, the following day, and uh, which shows um, severe axonal loss. Uh, so basically, you shock the nerve, you can't, don't get uh, any response, especially the low extremities. And the patient also had a, a MRI of the lumbar spine, which reported diffuse enhancement and the thickness of the the uh, intrathecal nerve roots, uh, especially the anterior roots and especially the proximal uh, segment. So the patient was diagnosed with uh, acute motor axonal neuropathy. Uh, so we know it's a variant of a GBS. Uh, GBS, uh, it's a, the, the classic GBS uh, or, or another nickname called acute um, uh, acute demyelinating, uh, uh, acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy or AIDP, and it's an acute symmetric flaccid weakness. Um, the proximal usually more severe than distal, and the low extremity is usually more severe than upper extremities. And uh, some patients, about a one third of patient, might have a facial uh, weakness bulbar palsy and respiratory failure, just like our patients. Um, uh, patients, most patients have a sensory loss, um, let on the, the, especially the distal extremities, the, in the hand, in the legs, in the feet, and also the pain, as uh, uh, some patients present with pain, especially back pain. It's, uh, uh, um, um, it's kind of a typical presentation, and that's why some patients are send it, uh, back uh, and, uh, home a uh, couple times from ER because uh, just presented with sensory symptoms and back pain without uh, significant uh, muscle weakness. And when you examine the patient, um, the reflexes usually decrease or you could not get any reflexes. Um, about 30% of patients uh, uh, needs need a ICU admission and the patient eventually or uh, uh, intubation and uh, mechanical ventilation. Um, if you do EMG neural kind of study, the typical e e uh, GBS patient will show also demyelinating features like uh, uh, prolonged latency, uh, slow conductive velocity, and amplitude are relatively normal. Uh, so the, uh, you do spinal tap, the CSF study, uh, the typical cases where it shows uh, amino cytologic uh, dissociation, um, uh, especially after one or two weeks, uh, the uh, CS, uh, CSF usually shows typical uh, for findings. Uh, there's uh, several uh, variant, like uh, the, uh, why is acute motor axonal neuropathy, just like our patient. And, uh, the second one is called acute motor ac sensory axonal ne neuropathy. Others uh, are uh, Miller Fischer syndrome. Uh, the fourth one is uh, it's rare. Uh, sometimes you can see this like a pharyngeal, cervical, brachial weakness with uh, uh, ptosis. That's basically it's uh, uh, mainly affect the upper body. The typical uh, classical GBS usually affect the lower body more than upper body. Uh, so, uh, admission to ICU, uh, I was just uh, 
about 30% of the patient uh, will be at the ICU. Uh, usually, if a patient has uh, respiratory insufficiency uh, by uh, clinical features, or you monitor respiratory function, uh, especially like if uh, FVC less than 50, 15 or um, uh, oxygen uh, uh, levels less than 70 patients uh, admitted ICU, um, patient may need intubation anytime. Uh, another study shows if FVC drop 50%, the intubation required within 36 hours. And if FVC drop to one liter, uh, the intubation uh, needed in 18 hours. And also the study shows the early intubation, um, um, the patient will have less uh, complications. You do emergency intubation, the patient always has more complications. So for GBS patients, especially like a, a progressive uh, um, GBS, like I would call ascending weakness, so patient has a, um, signs of uh, boba palsy sim uh, symptoms. Uh, patient need an animated ICU um, to monitor uh, respiratory function, and the patient may need intubation anytime. Regarding treatment of GBS in the ICU, uh, there's, a, there's two major treatments. One is uh, plasma exchange, another is uh, IVIG. Um, the clinical trials in 1980s shows uh, plasma exchange uh, was effective. It's patient recovered better and quicker than uh, supportive care. Uh, in 1990s, there's clinical trials shows IVIG uh, that are equally if, uh, effective as uh, plasma exchange. And the more studies shows IVIG alone or plasma exchange alone, uh, uh, the equal to plasma exchanging plus IVIG. So they usually which we, uh, the patient need, just need one treatment, either IVIG or plasma exchange. But in practice, a lot of time, um, a patient end up to get a two treatment because you know, patient after one treatment, the patient's clinically still getting worse. Uh, so the patient end up uh, get another treatment. Our patients, uh, after first IVIG, uh, the patient on a family thought uh, a little bit of improvement. So the patient and then getting worse, and the IVIG was uh, repeated. And the, another second session of IVIG was given the following week, and then later on, after a couple of weeks, the patient um, had a, a plasma exchange. Uh, that patient um, uh, uh, was still in hospital after. ICU, staying in ICU for a month, and then patient uh, uh, get a, a trachea and get a um, PEC tube, and then patient was transferred to Kendra Hospital, stayed there for a month. And recently, I checked uh, the, uh, the patient's record of from the patients in the uh, rehab, um, pressure re rehab, patient still has a severe weakness. Um, but uh, otherwise, uh, uh, respiratory function relatively stable. So another question is about the relapse. Uh, um, so as we know, uh, the GBS uh, usually is a monophasic. Um, it's so only like about 1% of patients might have, have a relapse s s symptoms. So there's several studies to uh, try to Figure out uh, what's the chance of uh, relapse. They use the this group. Uh, so, uh, so no treatment. Basically, the the patients, you know, uh, uh, the patients who are used for clinical trial, um, probably patient just get a placebo. There's a no IVIG, no plasma exchange, and this group are one percent relapse. Uh, after get a, uh, um, a plasma exchange, and uh, about four percent patient shows relapse. Uh, the main reason that because other small groups, small group study uh, looks like, uh, you know, there's a more patient shows re relapse. S same thing, the IVIG treatment group, the up to 10%. Also, I think it's because the small number uh, patients, uh, if you uh, uh, get rid of these two small groups, there are uh, relapse is still about 5% uh, or 6%. Or uh, also, in another group in, from the clinical trial, 
that shows the plasma exchange and plus IVH is about 7%. So overall, the re relapse probably 1 to 5 or 6 percent. So the uh, GBS is still uh, uh, most time is uh, monophasic. Current uh, uh, guideline from the American Academy of Neurology. Uh, so this shows uh, the, uh, the plasma exchange is, is established as an effective and should be offered to severe GBS patients. Uh, same thing, IVIG is uh, elective as, uh, and it should be offered to treat a, a GBS in adult, but uh, probably they don't have much evidence for pediatric patients. Uh, so, uh, lately there's a very detailed uh, guidance uh, in uh, diagnosing, uh, diagnosis of uh, uh, and the treatment of GBS. And it shows a 10 steps approach, approach to diagnosis and the management of GBS. Uh, so, so basically, um, the patient, if a patient uh, presented with uh, uh, progressive uh, uh, sensory symptoms and weakness, and when you examine the patient, there's uh, no reflexes, or patient some has a boba, start have boba symptoms, you know, there's a high suspect for uh, GBS. Uh, and that should be considered to uh, admitted to ICU if patient has any questionable respiratory status, and the treatment has IVIG and the plasma exchange. In the meantime, you watch, you monitor the patient's complications. Uh, so another thing Sandra uh, mentioned, uh, some patient, uh, you know, uh, uh, still shows uh, re recovery even after three years. Uh, so the patients with GBS patients, I usually tell patients, you know, never give up till, uh, you know, the patients still have a, uh, uh, chance to recover even after three or four years. Um, this, uh, this is a very good article for residents if uh, somebody wants to read it. So the, this article in the Nature Review Neurology, so 2019. So another disease leading patient to ICU admission is uh, methania gravis. And uh, everybody knows methania gravis very well. It's usually a patient presented with uh, fluctuating weakness or fatigue, uh, especially ocular muscles. Uh, patient have ptosis, double vision, broad vision, and some patients have bulbous uh, symptoms, uh, dysarthria, dysphagia or something, and then limb weakness. Basically, methania gravis affect the upper body uh, more than lower body. Uh, uh, the patient should not have any sensory um, uh, uh, complaints like uh, numbness, tingling or something. When you examine the patient, the patient's uh, reflex is relatively normal, so that's different to GBS. About 30% of the patient uh, uh, develop respiratory failure or call methania crisis. The trick factor including anything. Um, uh, the most common is surgeries. I lately I got a, a couple of patients, you know, had a um, methania crisis after shoulder surgery. Uh, other things like any kind of infection, like pneumonia uh, uh, or U UTI, um, um, or even like a stress uh, can uh, trigger methania crisis. Um, how to diagnose uh, methania gravis? We used to use the tensile test. As it shows a picture here, the before tensile and after tensile, you can see the significant improvement. Uh, this is, you can tell, it's a, uh, you, you feel comfortable to diagnose with uh, methania gravis. Um, other tests uh, for diagnosis including repetitive nervous stimulation. Uh, Amanda gave a very detailed explanation uh, about uh, repetitive nervous stimulation last week, so I'm not going to repeat it. Basically, in methania gravis, you will see called decrement. The amplitude become lower and lower uh, after repetitive stimulation of the nerve, we call decrement. Uh, for another condition, uh, as we know, is uh, uh, lambert eden syndrome. In that case, the amplitude actually increase uh, after repetitive stimulation, amplitude increase, we call increment. Um, so, of course, for methania gravis, we check antibodies, uh, especially anti-acetylcholine receptor antibody. Uh, you can see then the 50% ocular methania gravis, 
patients or 90% generally less the methanogramous patients will have the antibody. Uh, the second antibody is a mask antibody, about 5%. Um, the third antibody, um, uh, the LRP4, about 1%. Uh, usually we don't check, uh, I usually check anti acetylcholine receptor antibody. Uh, if uh, this come back negative, but a clinical, clinically patient really sounds like a methanogramous, I will check anti mask antibody. Um, this for the diagnosis. Um, the ICU, um, there's no large study um, about the ICU admission, but basically any patient with a questionable, questionable or respiratory status should be admitted to ICU. And you do frequent FVC or NIF measurement, basically it's a, a monitor uh, respiratory function. Um, very similar to GBS, if the FVC less than 15 or NIFs less than 30, and the patient probably need intubation anytime. The early intubation or selective intubation is still better than emergent uh, intubation. That will reduce the pulmonary complications. Uh, we get the treatment of uh, uh, methanol crisis. Uh, Still, two major treatments. One is IVIG, and, uh, and another one is plasma exchange. And the clinical trials shows uh, IVIG and uh, plasma exchange. Um, so basically, there's uh, no different. Uh, and some some said the plasma exchange is slightly better uh, than IVIG, and uh, uh, probably just the patient shows the recover, uh, recovery improvement a little bit quicker than IVIG. Uh, uh, usually the after plasma exchange, you know, uh, you may see some improvement within like a two or three days. Uh, IVIG take a little longer, up to a week. Um, but the guideline, this is still the, the evidence. Uh, there's a, no strong evidence, no insufficient evidence to support or uh, refer to uh, the use of uh, plasma exchange. They just the level you. Um, that's for plasma exchange for, for the reason. Uh, but I, IVIG actually, it's a, uh, they say it's a, uh, probably effective and it should be considered to treat moderate or severe uh, methanol gravis, like a methanol cr crisis. I think the guideline become a little uh, controversial. That's why in uh, later on, after several years, um, they have a international consensus guidance for management of uh, methanol gravis. So this is a very good article. I recommend all residents uh, to read this. I will tell you how to, you know, uh, manage um, uh, methanol gravis patients. Um, now here I just give a, a, a little bit of summary of uh, plasma exchange and IVIG in uh, uh, the, these two major treatment. Uh, the number one plasma exchange and IVIG uh, are used uh, as a short term in patients with methanol gravis with the life threatening signs, such as respiratory insufficiency uh, or dysphagia, basically we call severe methanol uh, exacerbation or crisis, or in preparation for surgeries. And, uh, so we know some patients will, will need a like thymectomy, and before thymectomy, especially in the patient who has uh, vulva uh, symptoms, patient need an IVIG, or who patient who need a re rapid response to the treatment or any kind of like a procedures like colonoscopy or something, um, you give patient IVIG before the procedure. Uh, another condition is other treatment like uh, mestino or other immunosuppressive agent uh, are not insufficient or not effective, you, you give IVIG uh, or plasma exchange. Or some say, you know, if, uh, if you start a steroid, especially high dose of steroid, uh, potentially um, back, uh, the, uh, make uh, the symptoms of worse, and say you might try plasma exchange or IVIG before starting a high dose of a steroid. Um, the choose between uh, uh, a plasma exchange and, and IVIG depends on individual patient fact. Uh, like uh, um, 
uh, if a patient has a sepsis, probably you don't want to give patient a plasma exchange that causes contamination. Uh, if a patient has a renal failure or heart failure, you do you don't want to give a patient IVIG or a patient has a history of a DVT or other you know PE or so you don't want to give a patient IVIG because that's a significant increase the risk of venous thrombosis. Or oh, these two treatment depends on availability of each. Um, um, now that most local small hospital can give patient IVIG, um, but they cannot do plasma exchange. So that depends on uh, where uh, the patient, uh, uh, which hospital fetch patient has. Um, so IVIG, this IVIG plasma exchange uh, is usually effective in treating severe general relaxed methanol gravis, but for mild or ocular methanol gravis, uh, we usually don't give patient IVIG or plasma exchange. Um, the plasma exchange may be more effective than IVIG in mask uh, uh, methanol gravis. That means, you know, as we know, the mask uh, uh, methanol gravis, uh, most of the patients will have for vulvar symptoms. Um, so if a patient with vulvar symptoms, maybe you might consider plasma exchange um, before IVIG. Uh, so the IVIG uh, can be uh, used as a maintenance therapy for refractive methanol gravity. So we do this all the time. Uh, you know, this patient has, uh, still have uh, severe symptoms, uh, and the patient needs IVIG uh, monthly. Uh, we can do like uh, the home infusion or uh, IVIG, but you cannot do plasma exchange in the every month. Uh, usually we don't do that. Uh, you, you have to admit the patient to do that. So overall, this is a very good, uh, very good article. I recommend residents uh, read the article. So now uh, let's talk about the, uh, another case. Um, the patient uh, was a 60 years old lady. Uh, with a history of a COPD um, presented to ER with a severe uh, COPD exacerbation. Um, the patient needs uh, intubation in the ER and uh, started treatment uh, of uh, uh, steroid or therapy. And then the patient admit the ICU. Uh, in the ICU, patient receive uh, more, uh, several antibiotics uh, for pneumonia because the x-ray shows uh, uh, possible pneumonia. Of course, in the ICU, patient was intubated on, on ventilation, patient get the lorazepine and the Versed, uh, all time for sedation. And the patient also had an uh, insulin sliding scale uh, because the hyperglycemia after steroid uh, treatment. And uh, this patient didn't get any neuromuscular blocking agent. Um, so the ICU, a patient's ICU course was complicated by uh, acute respiratory distract syndrome, and also the patient developed uh, tension, uh, pneumothorax, pneumothorax uh, patient required chest tube. Um, like uh, most of patients we see in the ICU, the patient has mental study changes, asking the neurologist to see the patient, so, oh, that's the acute encephalopathy with multifactory. That's the patient has a hundred reasons to have, uh, you know, mental state changes, the patient has a uh, metabolic reason and the infection, the patient get a lot of uh, sedation. And the patient had a difficult winning from ventilation. Uh, finally, the patient um, shows improvement and, and activate uh, in about a month. After activation, the final patient has severe muscle weakness and also muscle atrophy. Um, they ask the neurologist to see the patient again, and uh, the neural examination shows uh, the muscle strength about two or three or five in the proximal muscles, and zero to two or five uh, in the distal muscles. So basically, you can tell from the feet. Uh, 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 activation of it that means there's no muscle strength uh, in the lower humidities and uh, also shows uh, uh, the muscle wasting here. Um, the patient was awake and uh, then the coconut do exam and it shows the sensory loss to all modalities uh, uh, in below the forearm and below the knees. There's a, it's a typical we call stocking gloves stocking distribution of sensory loss. 
uh, they did, the patient didn't have any reflexes. The patient had a neurochemical study which shows uh, sensory model, axonal, peripheral, polyneuropathy, uh, especially in the low humidity. So basically, the low humidity, you do the neurochemical study, and there's no any uh, responses. Um, so this patient had a, a nerve and a muscle biopsy. Uh, the muscle biopsy shows a kind of scatter uh, angular muscle, or degenerated muscle fibers, we call uh, neurogenic. And also nerve biopsy shows uh, significantly reduce uh, the nerve fibers. Uh, so this patient was diagnosed with uh, radical ionic uh, polyneuropathy. Actually, this is a very typical case of uh, Critical uh, ionic polyneuropathy. Um, so the disease is acute neuromuscular d d disease uh, happening in the IC in the ICU, uh, including a critical ionic polyneuropathy and a critical ionic uh, myopathy. I will spend a little more time uh, about these two conditions. Um, discuss these two conditions. The, this is not a new uh, new uh, concept. Actually, uh, the, the 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 first article uh, published in uh, in early 1980s. There are five cases. Um, the patient was admitted to ICU uh, for uh, lactate acidosis, uh, emphysema, COPD exacerbation, pneumonia, and a wise head trauma. They found. Uh, all of uh, five patients developed uh, new, new neuropathy. Like the first case, uh, the last for more than 24 months. Uh, the second case lasts for more than 10 months, and then more than three months, and more than five months, more than uh, uh, this one, uh, three months. So more than three months, the, the patient, all patients developed neuropathy. They, they did a neurochemical study and the EMG. Uh, on, uh, on this patient shows uh, so basically the uh, conducting velocity and um, uh, latency uh, relatively uh, uh, normal or borderline, but the amplitude is significantly re re reduced. And the axonal loss, and the peripheral neuropathy with the axonal loss. Uh, they did a nerve biopsy, which shows a significant reduce of uh, nerve fibers. Um, so um, the typical uh, the CIP uh, as the patient, uh, like uh, the study shows, um, the CIP is it's very common. There's a more than 50% ICU patients, uh, especially patient the patient has a sepsis or some organ failure. Uh, well, uh, developed uh, uh, CIP. Um, CIP also developed very early. The study shows like three days after sepsis, uh, the patient already developed CIP. And some five, six days uh, after ventilation, patient developed CIP. So it's very underdiagnosed. Um, probably this ICU um, team took a to, uh, monitor this condition since there's no a special treatment. Uh, overall, it's a very underdiagnosed. Um, the typical um, presentation of uh, typical features of uh, CIP is uh, acute encephalopathy followed by difficult winning from the ventilation. And then the patient has a muscle weakness and uh, atrophy uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the arms, legs, especially the distal limbs. Um, and the cranial nerve relatively unremarkable. And the patient usually lost reflexes. Uh, the patient lost sensation. If you can do the patient's relatively awake, and if the patient wake, you can do sensory exam, the patient finds sensory loss. If you do nerve can study EMG shows uh, uh, the axonal ne neuropathy. Uh, so the one study uh, shows actually because a lot of patients have trouble winning from the vent. So they d they did a, f a study on phrenic nerve and the diaphragm muscle. Uh, the first uh, first study shows here they found the, the amplitude of uh, of phrenic nerve uh, is extremely low. So basically, it's axonal loss of uh, 
phrenic nerve. Uh, when you stick a needle in the diaphragm, shows uh, the neuropathic changes. You can see the sharp waves and the fibs uh, in the diaphragm muscle. Another study even more aggressive. Uh, they compared the normal of phrenic nerve uh, to the you know the patient phrenic nerve. You can see the amplitude significantly reduced. Uh, they even did uh, the partial phrenic uh, uh, nerve biopsy, which shows significantly reduce of nerve fibers. So basically, the CIP patients, um, uh, uh, the phrenic nerve and the diaphragm are involved. Uh, so the diagnosis criteria usually patient have uh, you know in the ICU patient has a sepsis or other multi organ failure or something, then patients just develop severe weakness and some patients will have a, like a muscle atrophy and the patients are winning, have trouble winning from the vein. And if we do the nerve connection where it shows axonal neuropathy. Uh, uh, so that's the uh, diagnosis criteria. And in the older days, they do repetitive stimulation. Basically, they want to rule out the possibility of a neuromuscular junction disease like a methylene gravis, uh, something. Um, so that's the CIP. There's another, the, in 1990s, they also noticed the CIA, uh, ICU patient not develop uh, um, um, critical illness, um, poly neuropathy. Also, the some patients, you know, the sensation relatively normal, but the patients are very weak. The thing about a, you know, possible myopathy. Here's the study, uh, the article published in 1996 uh, shows acute myopathy of the ICU. Uh, they totally have like 14 cases. Um, uh, um, they did a neuroconductive study. The patients were like a, a severe, has had a severe weakness. They did a neuroconductive study. They found that the sensory nerve relatively normal. Uh, so that's make a uh, neuropathy less likely. Uh, and then the patients that went to the needle yams, not only the distal muscle, also found abnormality in the proximal muscle. That's what they did a muscle biopsy uh, that shows the patient had a significantly uh, myopathic changes. You see the muscle fiber necrosis and the reassembly shows the re regeneration and especially the type two fibers. And they did a EM uh, that uh, shows some like a, a filament loss. Uh, so they think uh, this is not um, uh, uh, neuropathic, so some myopathic. So they call critical ionis myopathy or CIM. Uh, they find the CIM is very common in ICU. They at least like one third of ICU patients are treated for uh, status asthmatic or or like a COP, CO, uh, COPD exacerbation and we developed a uh, CIM. And another study shows all 22 critical our patients shows a clinical elect uh, electrical diagnostic or muscle biopathy evidence of uh, primarily myopathy. Uh, so this is a very underdiagnosed too. Uh, at the reason probably because there's a no uh, special treatment. I will talk about this later. And so that's why people did not pay attention too much. Um, so also there's the one study shows actually CIM it's a little more common than CIP. I would I will talk about this later. Uh, <clears throat> the typical clinical features of CIM, including so acute or subacute, diffuse and a flaccid weakness uh, after ICU admission. They involve all limbs, especially the proximal muscles. Um, not like a CIP, it's a distal muscle. This is the proximal muscle more severe than distal and uh, relatively symmetric. Also, the neck muscle were involved, neck, facial, or sometimes even ocular muscle might be involved too. And uh, most of patients have a diaphragm uh, paralysis, so, uh, so that's the reason patient cannot win from the ventilation. Um, if patients are awake, uh, you will find that the sensation relatively normal, so that's different to CIP. Uh, also, reflexes um, could be normal and could be slightly uh, decrease. It's not like a C CIP, the, uh, it's a uh, reflexia in all limbs. Um, some patient even shows uh, elevated CK, about 50% of cases elevated CK. 
Uh, if we do the nerve canister EMG, which shows some myopathic features. Uh, so basically, the nerve conduction study, as I mentioned earlier, it's a relatively normal or some borderline uh, findings. The needle EMG will show significant myopathic changes. Uh, so the, the one study uh, in uh, 2011, uh, basically this is a very aggressive study. The study phrenic nerve, uh, needle EMG of diaphragm muscle, or did a muscle biopsy in the diaphragm. I don't know this kind of study kind of that. Uh, so um, the phrenic nerve shows here the amplitude relatively normal, and, but the needle EMG shows some myopathic changes. Um, it shows a low amplitude and the recruitment, um, re recruitment increase. That's what we call myopathic changes. And the muscle biopsy of the diaphragm muscle shows uh, uh, myopathic changes. It shows here degenerative muscle fibers. The EM also shows uh, filament, thick filament loss here. So the, uh, if you don't uh, do uh, diaphragm muscle, you do other skeletal muscle also shows uh, very s similar um, findings uh, like a de uh, degenerated muscle fibers here, especially the type two muscle. Here's the ATPS pH uh, 9.4, usually shows a dark uh, staining. It's a type two muscle fiber that shows significantly reduce. Uh, the EM shows, uh, yes, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the thick filament loss. Uh, this is a relatively normal here. It's a normal. Uh, uh, this you can see the significantly uh, uh, reduce the number of uh, um, thick filament. So diagnosis criteria for CIM, um, the ICU patients, special patients, uh, multi-organ failure or some like a or other treatment uh, in the ICU. Uh, and then the patient developed uh, the muscle weakness, or the flaccid weakness, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, if you do the uh, neurochemical study, it's relatively normal or slightly reduced amplitude or something. But uh, if the needle EMG will show some myopathic changes. Uh, so you have, of course, you always rule out other possibilities. Uh, the muscle biopsy, neural biopsy is optional. There's an, uh, so because since we're now changing the management, we can do clinical diagnosis. Um, these two conditions, CIM and the CIP. Um, uh, so basically, uh, the CIM, uh, the risk factor including like a, like a steroid uh, or other neuromuscular junction blockers. Uh, um, CIP, the sepsis or multi-organ failure. Basically, this risk factor, you cannot tell which one cause which, um, they usually cause both conditions. But the clinical uh, features are a little bit different. In CIM, of course, the patient has a pure motor uh, deficit, the pure muscle weakness. But in uh, CIP, patient with sensory loss. Uh, CK is maybe elevated in 50% of the case, but it usually is normal in CIP. Uh, nerve conduct study is relatively normal in CIM and we show axonal loss in the CIP. Um, needle EMG, we show some myopathic here and the neuropathic here in CIP. Um, the pathology, <clears throat> we usually uh, don't do biopsy, but if you really want to do biopsy, we'll see um, uh, the muscle called myopathic changes, uh, oh. muscle fiber degeneration, um, and the myosin loss, and this shows uh, neuropathic changes. Uh, recovery, this critical illness myopathy a little bit better than um, uh, critical illness of polyneuropathy. So this one's a slow, take a week or so month. This take a much longer, the month or even years. Um, so uh, then we talk about these two conditions. Actually, a lot of time these two conditions coexist. Um, this study shows uh, CAM and CIP are frequently found in combination. So that's the so uh, they call critical ionic polyneuropathy and the myopathy called CIP and M. Um, so there's several studies. The first study was done in 1996 and it shows totally 14 patients. Uh, and um, the 14 patients, they found that all of them shows uh, uh, myopathy. Uh, but 
eight of 22 patients shows evidence of uh, neuropathy. So a lot of time there's a combination. The another study shows 10 patients uh, with the CIP. Actually, the you know, muscle biopsy in all the 10 patients found that all of them have uh, some myopathic features. So this is the uh, so two uh, conditions that coexist uh, in most of the cases. Um, risk fact, uh, there's uh, many study uh, try to figure out what kind of uh, risk factor. This is a very busy slide, so I'm uh, do this a little bit of summary here. Basically, anything happening at the ICU could be risk factor. There's uh, no special ones. You can see if they included like sepsis, multi-organ failure, or systemic inflammatory response syndrome, or other like a long duration organ failure, or some like renal failure with dialysis, extended ICU stay, um, nutrition, the total uh, parent, parenteral nutrition, and or osmolality changes, hyperglycemia, the treatment, uh, the medication includes steroid, neuromuscular blocking agent, or some vasopressor, or even antibiotics. Um, of course, it's a, it's a Elderly patients has more chance to develop these two conditions, and the shows of female patients are a little more common. Uh, so basically, anything happening in ICU could be risk factor. Uh, pathogenesis still don't know. Uh, there's some theory like this could be uh, um, uh, vascular, especially micro uh, vascular conditions like including hypoxemia or some metabolic reason or even electrical alteration that some like a channel changes uh, uh, ch channel uh, dysfunction so basically we still don't know the uh, the cause we don't know pathogenesis that's the, the theory um, so um, since these two conditions are so very common so there's uh, several studies, uh, you know, try to find uh, the treatment. Uh, uh, since IVIG uh, works for Guillain-Barre syndrome or another condition, as we know, the CADP, chron chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, or CADP. So they try to use the CAD IVIG for uh, critical illness, uh, polyneuropathy. Uh, the clinical trials was done in um, 1994, uh, so failed. Basically, there's no difference. And uh, several years later, in uh, 2013, they tried to use like IgM enriched IVIG. Basically, still shows uh, does not uh, mitigate uh, the condition either. So basically, IVIG um, uh, is not effective. Uh, I've, I have not seen the study about the. Uh, plasma exchange, um, but at least IVIG is not effective. The second study um, 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 is about uh, intensive in insulin treatment. Uh, this uh, study published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Sorry. Sorry, I think it's some, uh... okay. So the, the published the New England Journal of Medicine was done in 2001. And there's two groups. One is uh, um, use uh, the conventional uh, insulin dose. Uh, another group use in high dose uh, insulin dose and keep uh, the conventional treatment group uh, keep insulin uh, you know, about 150. The intensive insulin uh, treatment group can keep uh, the in, um, blood sugar so about 100. Um, this shows um, the, ins the intensive insulin treatment group uh, patient survival uh, better, uh, as it shows uh, here. Also, the death number of death um, uh, um, less. Uh, the most important they did uh, the uh, nerve kind of study EMG shows um, the 51 percent patient in conventional insulin treatment developed uh, neuropathy, but in intensive uh, insulin treatment only 28 
patient patient develop um, uh, 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 new neuropathy. So the conclusion is that intensive insulin therapy to maintain uh, maintain uh, 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 blood glucose um, at or below 110 can significantly reduce development of uh, uh, CIPAM. Uh, this can another study uh, sh that shows uh, electrical muscle stimulation. It's a direct uh, stimu stimulation of the muscles. Uh, they shows one is tre treatment group, another is uh, you know uh, non treatment group. They found that the treatment uh, treated uh, group shows muscle strength is better than untreated uh, the group, the control group. Also, uh, the development of uh, CIPAM uh, in treatment group is only 12%. The untreatment group, control group, uh, almost 40%. So that's a significant difference. Uh, so the patient uh, stay in ICU shorter and uh, also um, stay on ventilation relatively shorter. So uh, this study, they say, you know, the electrical muscle stimulation uh, could uh, reduce uh, uh, the CIPAM. Uh, the early physical therapy in my work, uh, but there's uh, no um, uh, clinical trial. That's all, but I think probably it's difficult to do clinical trial in this case. But we, uh, you know, uh, all the uh, physical therapy, it's, you know, uh, all time, uh, try to get a physical therapy as early, early as possible. That's probably significantly reduce the development of uh, uh, CIP or CIM. Um, so, uh, if anything else we can do, they say, you know, this patient shows here. Like uh, patients are not moving uh, for more than ten days, and as any uh, anything else, uh, we can prevent the ICU related weakness. Uh, so, um, but obviously, the more study is needed. Uh, so, we, number one, we don't know, you know, the the, the pathogenesis. Of course, the treatment uh, is not as specific. Uh, hopefully, there's some more. Uh, uh, studies, you know, be done, uh, find the, the specific treatment for these two very common conditions. Prognosis, uh, there are several studies, uh, there's a very busy slides, and put a, the, the summary for this. Uh, the prognosis, basically, the spontaneous uh, uh, recovery can happen uh, within weeks in mild cases. The severe cases uh, will take uh, many months. Um, complete recovery can happen in 50% of patients, but still one third of patients remain severely disabled after ad ICU admission. Um, um, the one reliable uh, predictor is uh, a nerve connection study. If a nerve connection shows unrecordable, the model response or CMAP uh, usually indicated that. Uh, you know, the uh, severe functional disability uh, for a long time. Usually up to five years, the patient, if severe patients, if we do uh, nerve connection, still shows abnormalities. Um, uh, very good. So today we talk about the uh, acute neuromuscular disease in the ICU. Basically, the two uh, uh, groups, one group like methina gravis or uh, Guillain-Barre, uh, leading patient to the ICU admission. And um, critical illness, uh, poly neuropathy and uh, critical illness myopathy uh, can happen uh, in the ICU. Uh, these two conditions are actually so, uh, are very common. And right now we still don't know uh, too much about uh, uh, pathogenesis. There's still no uh, specific treatment. The study shows probably intensive insulin therapy keep low normal of uh, blood sugar, maybe, you know, reduce the uh, development of CIP and CIM. Also, uh, uh, direct electric stimulation of muscles uh, maybe, uh, might reduce uh, development of these two conditions. Uh, I think I'm stop here. Uh, I'm happy to answer some questions.
Okay. Uh, thank you. Looks like a, sounds like a no no questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, have a good day. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Thank. Thank you.